I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse in the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. So, David, on July 19th of this year, President of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, announced that he did not believe the data uh, showing deforestation occurring in the Amazon rainforest. And just a month later, uh, on the 10th, Shut up, Daniel. The rainforest is on fire right now. We don't have time for your stupid, boring facts. Uh, Reading things like it's some lame-ass BBC news report. Uh, Literally, the lungs of the earth are burning down as we speak. Right. But I think it's important to note, David, that on the 10th of August, a bunch of Brazilian livestock ranchers uh, in the Brazilian state of Pará stopped along a highway they declared a national fire day, and then uh, they walked into the forest and set fire to huge swaths of the Amazon rainforest. Well, a bunch of rancher bros were like, you know what, today is a fire day, and we're just going to commit a bunch of arson in this like global ecological treasure. And uh, they like announced this. Yeah. This was like a celebration, like your right. uh, Truck Lives Matter sort of thing, like a bunch of guys... Uh, wandering around in this town, probably getting wasted, driving their trucks. And they're like, let's go burn down the rainforest. That sounds like a fun thing to do. Boys will be boys. I, I think we are probably inaccurately merging, uh, you know, U.S. Southern culture with uh, Brazilian culture. But I mean, essentially, in effect, practically speaking, yes. Okay. So uh, the city of Novo Progresso witnessed a 300% increase in fires, 124 total raging at the same time. And then the next day, that figure almost doubled again to 203 cases of fire. Uh, Another part of the region known as Atamira experienced a 743% increase in fires uh, on fire day. And, you know, fires exploded in other areas of the state as well. And apparently this was spurred by the president himself, not directly, but his comments have emboldened livestock ranchers to set fire to the forest to show their support of the president and their willingness to work. It's like, I don't know if you ever watched Avatar, Daniel, the, the animated series, um, not the uh, uh, like 3D blue Pocahontas um, horrible film. But, but you know what I'm talking about. The, it's like a semi-anime, but it's American-made. Um, it's like a child with a blue arrow on his head. Yeah, him. And uh, every episode begins... With, with, you know, the intro thing, and they're like, and everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked, and the Fire Nation, like, sets fire to the world. Do you think Bolsonaro watched this and was like, man, I'm going to be just like Fire Lord Ozu and burn down the earth and turn everything into, like, industry and fire? Um, because that's basically, like, what it sounds like he's doing right now. Right. Well, uh, you know, in other news, and this is unrelated, kind of, I think, But uh, forest fires are up in Brazil 80% this year across the board, uh, most likely because of climate change-induced drought and human-caused deforestation, um, in addition to all the fire days that are being declared. And just a couple of days ago, the city of Sao Paulo was plunged into complete darkness in the middle of the day uh, because of the smoke coming from uh, the fact that the Amazon rainforest is, you know, on fire. So Maybe you're onto something, David. A second age of darkness ushered in by the, well, well, maybe if he's not watching uh, Avatar, he's watching Lord of the Rings, and he saw, um, not Sauron, but Sauron in Isengard, like home of this beautiful forest, and and then Isengard, and then Sauron is like, okay, you know what, I'm going to build an army and industrialize my beautiful forest, and he burns everything down and builds all this machinery stuff. Once again, someone needs to stop showing him all these movies. He's clearly taking the wrong message from all of this. Um, It's too bad that, you know, he uh, he didn't die. What? Yeah. Well, you know, deforestation is a example of land use change. In this case, human driven. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just released a new report, David, about 
15 days ago or so on the 7th of August, 2019, and it's called Climate Change and Land, an IPCC special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and greenhouse gas fluxes in terrestrial ecosystems. Oh, nice. Does it have like large sections saying that we should burn the Amazon to the ground? Quite the opposite, actually. Oh. You'd be surprised. <laughs> what? Uh, so someone should send a, a Portuguese copy down to Brazil, I guess. Translators are working around the clock. Just haven't gotten to the uh, Portuguese edition yet. But you know, I have a confession to make, David. You didn't read it. Well, to, to be perfectly clear, I read the summary for policymakers. See, the full report is about, I don't know, it's about like 10 chapters. Each chapter is like 300 pages. So multiply that, you get a big number. And uh, I've spent the last four days or so transitioning from my old home, which was Atlanta, Georgia. Studio One. Studio One. The uh, original studio, if you will. And uh, I packed all my stuff into my car, uh, donated my mattress because it wouldn't fit. And I spent three days driving up. I stopped in North Carolina. Then I drove up to uh, New York City where I, after 12 hours of driving, I showed up at your doorstep at like 10 or 11 at night, came in, drank all the beer in your fridge, crashed on your couch, and then got up in the morning and drove on up. Mm -hmm. And here I am. I'm in Boston, Massachusetts, David. Hell yeah. Studio three. Oh, what was the point of that? So the point is I didn't have time to read 3,000 pages of intergovernmental panel climate change. Well, I also didn't read all 5,000 pages of intergovernmental panel uh, climate change data. Um, I also only summarized the uh, policymaker summary. And let me tell you, listeners, though I did skim some of the other sections, um, and I'm still actively reading through them, it is boring. This is a boring report and horrifying at the same time. You know, global destruction is often quite a dull topic to engage in. Um, but, but what the report does, it seeks to isolate the impacts or the drivers of climate change to just the land use changes going on in our world today. So, you know, ignore the ocean, ignore fossil fuels, ignore the fact that, you know, we're sending uh, rockets into space and we're just like burning oil wherever we please. Let's just look at the way the land functions, the way deforestation, wetlands, degradation, agriculture. Let's look at these things specifically and see how that connects to this broader picture of global climate change. So these are topics of desertification, land degradation, including soil erosion, vegetation loss, wildfires, permafrost thaw, and food security, dealing with crop yields and food supply. And then this report makes up five possible human trajectories, human civilization trajectories, and how these might be able to mitigate and adapt to these changes. Each one more implausible than the last. With some contradictions, which we'll get to. Uh, but what do you say we just jump into this report? Yeah, uh, we're going to just read you all, listeners, every page of these 41 pages of reports. So sit back, close your eyes, and fall asleep. Coffee is recommended. No, we would we wouldn't do that to you. This would, That was Daniel's original suggestion, but we're actually just going to uh, hit the highlights here. I told him that nobody would want to listen to that, but um, at least one of us is looking out for you. If you disagree with David and agree with me, send us an email. Contact at ashesashes.org. <laughs> Daniel's reading voice listeners right there. So I was surprised to learn that humans directly affect 70% of all land on Earth ice-free land, because we haven't quite conquered the ice shelves yet. And okay, so what's the other 30%? Well, 12% is just barren rock. So we're pretty good about settling almost every part of the earth, right, David? Well, well I mean, what does that leave? If 30% is relatively untouched, 12% of that is literally just barren or rock. And that leaves only 16% of the earth, Daniel, 7% that's unforested, 9% that's forested. That counts as uh, intact with minimal human use. And it's not even no human use, it's just minimal human use. So that, that is, out of the 130 million square kilometers on Earth, that is considered ice-free land. So not counting, you know, most of Antarctica. That leaves us with just 16% that isn't barren rock, that is actively allowing life to grow on it, which is about 20 million uh, square kilometers. That's 
I mean, that sounds like a lot when you say 20 million square kilometers, but that's just 16% of basically the quote unquote usable uh, amount of Earth. Well, you also said 7% of minimal human use is unforested. That's, that probably includes things like deserts. Certainly some deserts, yes. Yeah. And when you think about our impact on the Earth, you know, a lot of people might think of cities. These are huge mega structures of concrete and steel, just like, you know, whatever natural land used to exist there is just completely paved over. Or they might think of highways or even those suburb, you know, sprawling suburbs that we talked about a couple uh, weeks ago. But in fact, David, the most common use of land that we have converted the natural earth to on this planet is devoted entirely to some form of food production. Cropland is a whopping 12% of all ice-free land on earth. And then the land that we use for pastures is even way higher than that. It's, it's the single largest use of ice-free land on this planet. Right. And, and that surprised me, I think, because, I mean, I guess it shouldn't surprise me, but we eat so much meat that, I mean, that requires a whole bunch of land to set aside. And then it's not just the pasture land that we have to set aside, but then it's, we have to grow all the crops just to feed the animals. Right. And so that comes up to 37% of the Earth's ice-free land surface alone is dedicated to some sort of pasture work. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind. An important reason why we're talking about just land in the context of global climate change is because, according to the data, air surface temperature above the land is warming twice as fast as the global average. So this is 1.5 degrees of Celsius warming versus just 0.87 degrees which is the mean surface air temperature uh, over land and ocean. And all this change that's going on on the planet, David, all this land use that we are uh, intensively developing accounts for one quarter, 23% of all human-caused climate change, principally stemming from agriculture and deforestation. But it doesn't end right there, Daniel. This number, as we've talked about on this show so extensively, is heavily linked to these larger ideas of logistics. And so when you take all the logistics necessary to make this global food supply system function, to get all that, that product where it needs to go to be grown and then take it ultimately to consumers, that adds up to as much as 37% of all of the human emitted greenhouse gases basically coming straight from our food system, the very supply we need to live. Mm. But there is a lot of waste in that system, Daniel. That's right. In fact, 30% of all the food we produce is either lost, spoiled, or wasted. Which amounts to almost 8% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. Is that literally just food we're throwing away? Um, if, if we're talking about you know, climate change in these words that, that a lot of politicians and economists like to use in terms of the carbon budget, well, that seems like a pretty easy way to tighten that belt. And sure, some of that needs to be taken to the hundreds of millions of people who are undernourished. But at the same time, there are 2 billion people on this planet that are mentioned in this report for being overweight or obese. Yeah, I mean, the amount of calories that we each consume has increased. In fact, globally, since 1961, food calories per capita has increased by a third. It's important to point out, you know, we, we talk about agriculture, but I'm reminded of our episode, Fast Fashion, where we talk about the environmental impact of all this clothing production that we see around the world, our H&Ms, our Zaras, our global supply chains that make it possible to have a new season every single week. This takes up much of the agricultural contribution of climate change. Again, since 1961, the amount of crops grown just for fiber production like cotton, a huge water intensive crop has increased by 162% up until 2013. Um, just to backtrack a second, uh, Daniel, and, and water is an important part of this larger conversation and we can go there. Um, I, I just want to, I got hung up on this overweight and obese stat and, and that calorie stat. Cause I noticed something interesting. Um, this report, we'll link to it up on uh, our page. You can read it at ashesashes.org. And uh, there's a lot of pretty graphs. And, uh, there's some graphs on page four that show, uh, what I'm talking about right here, which you mentioned that per capita calorie production has increased by uh, about a third in the past 50 years. Right. The prevalence of people who are overweight or obese has increased by almost 100% in that time. And I think that's really interesting that 
you know, you would think that overweight and obesity would probably track pretty similar to an increase in calories per capita and in fact lag behind it because there were so many people who at first were malnourished and are, are now, you know, hundreds of millions or billions who are, are no longer malnourished because of these incredible advances in uh, food technology, in, in these um, industrial agricultural revolutions, which you know, as bad as they are in terms of their effect on land use and greenhouse gases and sustainability, which we'll get to later on, did end up feeding a lot of people and did enable a lot of this explosive population growth that we've seen. But even that has lagged behind the number of people who are you know, overweight and obese. And I wonder how much of that is, is because that what we are growing and what we are eating and what is not getting wasted is so much worse for us. Um, you know, we've talked about in the past, uh, in one of our earlier episodes, episode 14, Sweet Release, about how sugar, for example, uh, is really a terrible source of calories, can cause all sorts of health problems, which, you know, it seems obvious now, but at the time when the food industry was really trying to focus on the evils of, of meat and the fat, it didn't seem so obvious. And, and we've learned since then, but there's still these things set in the way and uh, food science is still very much controlled by individual companies and lobbyists much more than the actual science itself. And and I wonder what we are growing, you know, and, and they talk a little bit about this in the report later on, but what we are growing probably isn't the stuff that's best for us in this process. You know, investing lots of money in Brazil to burn down the rainforest like you're talking about, Daniel, in order to grow more sugar cane is probably not the best use of those resources when we could be instead growing things that, that are not only better for the soil itself, uh, but also better for all of us. Yeah. And, and that's something that the report really doesn't talk about much in the policy summary. No. Um, I haven't gotten to the section on uh, crops yet in, in the more extended version. But I mean, the summary as a whole, I think this is a, a good moment to, to pull this aside and talk about it. It really tries to deal solely with the facts. And as you read through it, you'll see constantly, they'll say a fact and then they'll even in parentheses, um, give their, uh, how certain they are, whether it's true or not, you know, high certainty, low certainty, whatever. And they've really, really tried to limit themselves just to this very dry information. There is no room at all for any imagination or thinking outside of the status quo and of even what is marginally acceptable. And this is, this is true even in later on in the report when they're talking about some of the impacts that uh, continued climate change is going to have at 1.5, at 2 degrees, at 4.5 and, and beyond that are quite honestly, even in this report, cataclysmic. And you see there's like uh, these graphs with red for showing, you know, how high the severity of things impacting us is. And it's and then it turns to purple and, and it says, you know, basically all food supply instabilities at two degrees and above are just going to be constant. But I mean, it, it's a terrifying report. And then you get to the solution section and it's it's that same dry like, well, if we do these things or if we have this magical thinking, then but maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go. Let's go back to facts. Well, you mentioned that in the context of sugar and unhealthy foods that we've learned quite a bit relative to what we knew in the past. And I think even you, David, are being a little bit generous in this conversation because no one has ever accused me of that. <laughs> it's a first time, first time. But, you know, because if the listener will go back to episode 14 and listen to Sweet Release, you know, it's really a story less about what we knew or what we didn't know. I mean, there is a bit of that, right? You talk about uh, what was lost in the great wars from you know some Austrian experiment and in in the United States we kind of had to restart that but for the most part it's a story of corporations that hijack academic research for their benefit and use bribes and all types of intrigue to make their agenda go forward even when it's terrible for human health and public safety mm -hmm. and we hear from Margaret Chan in that episode the director or former director of the World Health Organization and you know she's actually more overtly critical of the role corporations have in this process. And I mean, you're talking about burning down the Amazon rainforest for something like sugarcane. This is really a story of how we have allowed corporations to set the agenda for public health, public safety, and really just own the resources of this earth with no accountability and no regulation. Yeah. Right. That's what's going on in the Amazon rainforest is the deregulation that opens the space for corporations to really pillage and 
extract and destroy in the name of short-term profits. Well, I think that might be why this that episode in particular is on my mind, because I feel echoes of that same sort of self-censorship. And I'm not sure if it's coming from the scientists who are afraid of getting things knocked out or, you know, the multitude of politicians, lobbyists, industry experts that comb through this uh, final draft that's going out to policymakers around the world in order to sanitize uh, the language, the ideas, you know, what's possible in the same way that these lobbyists, these scientists who are either directly funded by these corporations or being influenced by them did with these things that ultimately affect our health and the recommendations that we make for things like, you know, the food pyramid or something as simple as that. And, and I feel I feel. I can feel the influence as I read through this stuff, Um, the limitations of the conversations, the things they left out. So, I mean, there are extensive sections on desertification, and it just seems to be, you know, this magical process that happens as things get warm and ignores the fact that a lot of times um, desertification is driven not just by climate change and the fact that our biomes are shifting poleward in both directions, but also by the deliberate economic choices individuals make uh, governments push forward like we're seeing right now in Brazil, but also in the effects of things like imperialism and the violence and war that happens around the world. Desertification in the Middle East especially has been uh, dramatically increased over the past decade and a half through, in large part, the uh, military endeavors that are happening in places like Iraq and places like Syria that are pushed you know, by the interests of countries like the United States, like Russia, like Turkey. And, and our, our influence out there um, directly oftentimes burning crop fields, uh, the, all the oil that we, we burn out there. You know, we talk about this in our recent episode on the greenhouse gas emissions of the U.S. military, the largest polluter on the planet. You know, but, but these things are never even barely mentioned. They're not, you have to read between the lines so deeply or, or, or have this already pre-existing knowledge of what is causing all this stuff that, you know, you, you, if somebody with no knowledge of the earth and, and nothing, you know, just popped in, And they read this paper. It would just seem like, oh, you know, here's a bunch of things that are happening. And we have no idea why they're happening. You know, like, oh, there's just greenhouse gas emissions. Who knows where they come from or what they're doing or why we're emitting them. And, uh, you know, here's a pathway forward that we can try and explore in order to prevent this from happening and getting worse. And I'll talk about uh, some of the the gotchas with that in a little bit longer. But, you know, there's, there's no exploration of, well, maybe we should change what we're doing on, on not just a, a land use level or not just a on a like how to tackle the problem, I guess not problem, but symptom of these greenhouse gas emissions as the primary IPCC report mentions or sections of this one does. Um, but these larger systemic issues of like, why are we involved in these conflicts around the world, spreading this process, making it worse, exacerbating them, encouraging the economic choices that lead people like Bolsonaro to encourage ranchers to burn down the Amazon, you know? That is never explored. And it's funny, too, reading the media report on this specific IPCC report, which, again, came out just a few weeks ago. Most of the media articles about it came out on August 8th, so you can see them all. And you see, you know, in New York Times, in Time Magazine, in Economist, well, all these, these like very famous magazines, newspapers, uh, blogs, whatever, talking about, you know, if we don't change something, the world is going to be in a really bad place. And land use is a critical component of this, you know, read the IPCC report, blah, blah, blah. And they summarize and explain it and they lay it out and it, it looks bad. And then in the same paper, you turn the pages, the economist was pivotal in electing Bolsonaro and talking about how important it is to get him in power for the Brazilian state in order to spur their economy. And there's no irony in the fact that you have on in this same magazine you know, on one page, they're saying this is what Brazil needs. And on the next page, they're saying if we keep doing this, the world is going to be destroyed. And like now I've, I've gotten way off. Daniel. I don't know where this is coming from. But um, yeah, the food for thought. <laughs> food for thought. Sorry, that should have come at the end. <laughs> we haven't even finished talking about most of the report. Maybe we should get back to that. And I've, I've got more later. So, uh, yeah, if uh, anyone. Uh questioned our angle on this uh, question no longer. Spoiler. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Well, let me give you another more, a couple more facts, David. Since 1961, our use of nitrogen fertilizer around the world has exploded some 800%, right? And let me tell you the thing about nitrogen fertilizer. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Keep going, Dad. (laughs) And it turns out, you know, uh, unsurprisingly, agriculture accounts for some 80% of all the nitrous oxide that 
we humans release into the atmosphere. Pastures, of course, account for some half of that, some 40%. And nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas, which is 298 times more potent than CO2. That is, if you put one ton of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere, it's, you, know, you could have done the same effect by just putting 300 tons of CO2 in the air. And one of the other differences is that nitrous oxide persists in the atmosphere for over 100 years. And where is this coming from? Of course, nitrogen fertilizer is one of the big drivers of this. We are dependent on nitrogen fertilizer because of the industrial nature of agriculture, which kind of seeks to mine the soil, if you will, to boost yields as fast as possible in our crop production. But to do it, we have to use monoculture. We have to plant one series of crops so that our machines can harvest most efficiently. But then in order for that to survive, we need to use all these pesticides. And then we need to inject a whole bunch of nitrogen into the earth. Well, the problem is we don't use nitrogen fertilizer as efficiently as possible. And perhaps it would never be possible to use it efficiently in the sense that we apply just the right amount at the exact time that the plant is going to uptake it. So, so it just gets overapplied and then it ends up running off into nearby rivers or something, which has its own serious consequences, which we'll get to. And we talk a lot more about nitrogen fertilizer and better agricultural practices in episode 16, What We Reap. If you haven't heard that, definitely go back and put that on your list. But here's, here's a fact that's going to just shock you. David, it's just going to knock the socks right off your feet if you're wearing any. I am. So Only socks. I think also in episode 16, we mentioned that there are some predictions that global supply of topsoil will be pretty much completely depleted by mid-century. And topsoil, if you're not agriculturally minded, is the soil where crops grow. It's the layer of soil where all the important micro species are found, the organic material, the minerals and the nutrients where these plants actually derive the resources they need to grow. And it turns out that our conventional tillage agriculture is eroding the soil 100 times faster than it can uh, form on its own. Uh, You're right. That fact did knock the socks off of me because I underlined it like 60 times in the version of the, the paper that I took notes on. Um, and, and I also want to mention, just to accompany that fact, that while conventional tillage agriculture, like you mentioned, degrades soil at 100 times faster than it is replenished, uh, the alternative that most people mention, uh, non-tillage agriculture, if done in traditional large industrial ways, and that sounds sort of like a uh, oxymoron, but it, it can happen, even that degrades the topsoil at 10 to 20 times faster than the natural replacement rate. And of course, there are ways around that generating soil in a more responsible way. Um, there's various uh, techniques of, of keep taking care of your soil. And we talk about all that in that episode 16. Um, and it's absent from this report. But uh, those two stats alone should just be enough. Be like, whoa, what are we doing to the land? We're destroying it. Right. And the question arises, why is this happening? It's because our whole economy is based on borrowing from the future. And this, when I was first reading about climate change, as if it's like one topic, but as I was wrapping my mind around climate change and, and the future that we face for the very first time, this is the thing that really blew my mind. You know, I always thought that we were destroying the world in the sense of like, oh, you know, we, we pollute things and we, uh, you know, destroy the atmosphere, but we always have a way to generate food from the earth. I mean, what could be more sustainable or long-term than actually growing things, right? But again, it's just another example of how our entire economy is oriented around a way to place debt over ourselves, to borrow from something that comes from a future process, whether that's money or whether that's the soil itself. And it never occurred to me that you can actually extract from the soil. You can actually mine it like you do a rock ore, right? There's organic material and micro species that build up in soil over time, over long periods of time as the natural cycles take place. And it is very possible to just go in there, input a whole bunch of, of nitrogen fertilizer as a kind of nitrous boost. You know, think about nitrous in a, in a car engine and just... <laughs> exactly the same thing. <laughs> exactly the same thing. And just uh, encourage the high yield growth of, of crops that are just going to suck everything out of the soil. And you're left with a barren wasteland. And then, of course, once that soil is depleted, then the wind comes and strips it away. And 
now climate change is ramping up. So you got these intense rainfalls, which also carry soil away. And, and eventually you can't grow anything there anymore because you've destroyed it. Maybe if we, uh, we had like Fast and the Furious movies, but about um, not cars with nitro boosts, like you mentioned, but uh, like people were storing the soil in like really extreme ways. Uh, maybe, maybe that'd be a good start. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hollywood producer just hit me up. I got, I got some stuff to pitch you. You mean like, uh, I'm about to drift through here with a bunch of corn? No, no, no corn. Well, unless it's grown in like a three sisters sort of method that's responsible and sustainable. You know, to go back to funny things in this report, let me, let me scroll down to some of my notes here where I wrote a giant LOL. Let's see where this, where is this? Uh, when they're talking later on about mitigation strategies mm-hmm. and, you know, what we can do to save the earth and, uh, actions we can take in the near term, they have a section here about how we should be doing things like sustainable land use. And, and they pitch this as this like radical idea. And I had to stop reading and walk away at, <laughs> at that point because I thought it's so funny that, I mean, sustainable land use in the very definition, there's an like you're admitting that you're not using the land sustainably, that you're eventually going to run into this crisis that we've basically found ourselves in right now. And the fact that they have to pitch as a radical solution to this sustainable land use, I thought was just such a funny, like disconnected moment where I'm like, man, the fact that someone somewhere is like, Oh, I never considered sustainable farming or sustainable land use as a solution that, um, I don't know. I had a moment where I just had to walk away because I felt so disconnected from uh, whatever it is thinking that, that these policymakers and these industrialists must, must be <laughs> doing at, at all times that I just was like, I feel like I'm on another planet. It's like when your uh, grandfather learns like a new hip word that the young kids are using, you know, and like tries to like integrate it into a sentence. Yeah. That's what the IPCC is. It's like, hey, everybody, have you heard of this thing called sustainable land management sustainability yeah and they they pitch it as like radical thing that they came up with in think tanks or something not like people have been doing it for thousands of years until uh we came in taught everybody how to farm the right way realize it's the wrong way and then now we have to go and re-educate people how to do things sustainably because in that process of teaching people quote unquote the right way to farm we lost all the actually correct sustainable ways of farming because we've eliminated it culturally in order to push our, our mechanized, industrialized methods of feeding the world down our throat that ultimately led us to this place of doom. And, and not, once again, not to get ahead of myself, you can tell I'm really like itching to talk about this. But later on, they talk about um, one of the... You just have a party to get to, David. Oh, yeah, I, I, I do. But <laughs> later on, they, they get to this part where they're talking about um, more action in the near term. So this is on page 38. Uh, and they, they talk about knowledge and technology transfer can help enhance the sustainable use of natural resources for food security under a changing climate. Raising awareness, capacity building, and education about sustainable land management practices, agriculture extension, and advisory services, blah, 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 can help effectively address land degradation. Oh, yeah. You know, the, uh, the old-fashioned technological innovation to do things sustainably. Well, it was so funny. Once again, I, I had to stop reading here and walk away again because this quote unquote knowledge transfer oftentimes is scientists uh, and, and agricultural experts who have rediscovered indigenous old ways of farming that we know are sustainable, you know, like finding this again and, and then taking it as like a new discovery and helping people apply it. So, so recently Daniel and I were at Biosphere 2, um, which is famous for the failed uh, experiments in the early 1990s of trying to create an entirely sustainable uh, closed-loop system to prove that such something would be possible you know, on Mars or something. This was in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an amazing place. Uh, it's an amazing facility. It feels like a cult. If you're ever in Tucson, I would highly recommend checking it out. Uh, but the place is now owned by the University of Arizona now who uses it to research um, a lot of different things. And there's a lot of different biomes in this amazing closed facility. They can do a lot of very interesting experiments there. It's, it's amazing what, what they can do because of what was built uh, for hundreds of millions of dollars from this billionaire who, uh, I don't know what his motivation was. But one of the things they had there that I thought was funny, and there's actually a couple experiments there I think that are relevant to this show. But one of the things they had there was this tour guy who's taking us around and he introduces us to these uh, little, 
you know, boxes of dirt they have mm-hmm. that have uh, plants growing in them, and the plants look pretty healthy. And he's like, let me show you an ancient invention that we're now testing again. And it was basically just a, a terracotta pot put in the soil, and you fill it up with water, and you cover the top, the hole in it. And because it's terracotta, it breathes, it lets the water out, and it does so at a slow, measured way. And the roots of the plants around this pot come in and absorb it. And it's a very efficient way to use water, which is obviously especially important in desert environments like Arizona. And this is an ancient indigenous process they took from local indigenous populations who had been using this for thousands of years before we came in and taught everybody how to farm and how to grow, you know, Pima cotton on mass scale and industrial scale, which is uh, one of the famous in, uh, agricultural inventions of the University of Arizona there in Tucson and Pima County. And you drive past, you know, you're in the middle of the desert and then you drive past these endless lines of, of pure green uh, cotton fields. Yeah. You know, it's more hardy than traditional cotton, but it's still a water intensive plant, as we've talked about, especially in that fast fashion episode you mentioned, Daniel. And it's so funny to me that, that we're in this billions of dollar facility and they have a decent section set aside to just trying to understand this uh, old indigenous uh, method of, of you know, growing things sustainably and, and making sure that you're not impacting, you know, water use too much and land use too much. And it's a new, new piece of knowledge and technology that they're hoping to expand and then take out to farmers all around the world. And this is the kind of knowledge transfer that the IPCC is talking about right here. This is study and research that's happening right now. And they pitch it as this like, oh, we're going to go and teach these uneducated groups, you know, which is often a coded word in these things for uh, third world nations, developing nations that that don't have you know the the industrial might that you know companies like Corteva or or, or other of these ag science companies can come in and like show you the quote unquote the right way to do stuff, and oftentimes they're bringing technology that they pulled from the indigenous populations of these populations in the first place, making it sciency, oftentimes that that comes with a company packaging it and making profit off of it, and then bringing it back to these places that they took it from, made them forget because we imported and forced upon our old traditional industrial European style of agriculture. And, uh, and we've gone full circle. But we're the savior in this situation. The IPCC is pushing this as like, this is how to save the world. And ignores the fact that their fellow scientists that came ahead of them, that were pushing this ag science green revolution, are the ones that fucked it all up in the first place. There's no awareness or, or ad- admitting anywhere of any guilt or, or uh, of any knowledge of the past or the systemic issues that led us to this. And that was, was so frustrating. And I realized, you know, this is a summary, um, you know, maybe th- that would turn off the politicians and stuff, policymakers who are reading this, but we will never fix these problems without examining the roots of why they're problems in the first place. This is a report about treating symptoms and yeah, you know, sustainable land use. Um, a lot of the practices they talk about are good things. You know, we should be expanding processes like biochar, but without understanding why we have to do it now, I think entirely misses the point and sets us up for larger failure in the process, because then we reduce these conversations down to economic and quantitative conversations. You know, is it profitable to update your land to sustainable use? And they actually mention these numbers. They say it would take 50 to $2,000 per acre in order to turn it sustainable, um, with the, the median number being $500. And that's how they've define this, you know, as an economic question, ignoring, you know, this larger tragedy, the commons that is occurring. And this absolutely is a tragedy of the commons, which is ironic because this privatized land use system was something that was originally pitched to us as an elimination of the tragedy of commons. And it actually has enabled it at a grand uh, planetary scale, which would have never been possible if this land was commonly owned and preserved by people for the common good in the first place. But I'm, uh, once again, I'm, I'm getting beyond myself. But, you know, the conversation is always economic, quantitative. How much, you know, carbon can we sequester? How much uh, money would it cost us to do this? And there's never any sort of thought or time or words or energy put towards the fact that, you know, we should be doing this regardless of whether it makes economic sense. We should be doing this regardless of whether or not uh, governments have to subsidize this in such or such way, blah, 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 blah. You know, fuck it. This is the only way to move forward sustainably. In order to guarantee a future. And one of the things that, that I took away from this report is that a lot of the options that are available to us initially, in order to make sure that we do stay under those uh, dramatic 
temperature increases that 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 spell doom for things, especially like food stability, which I think is the, the main thing most people key in on because that's the thing that impacts them most um, immediately. You know, whether or not you can trust that your next meal is going to come and whether you can afford that meal. And the higher that temperature creeps, the farther we get above that baseline temperature, whether it's 1.5, whether it's 2, whether it's 3.5, whether it's beyond that, that insecurity, that question about whether we have a meal coming is going to be more and more uncertain as these temperatures climb, as we move into the future. And worse, as that temperature climbs higher and higher, the less options we have in these sustainable land use tools, in these other tools that the IPCC lays out to mitigate that disaster. Because the impact on land use, the impact on land, the things that we depend upon become much more dramatic in this process as the temperature increases and we have to set aside more, more land in order to make up for the difference. So if at four or four and a half degrees, uh, crop yields are significantly damaged because, uh, you know, at higher CO2 levels, um, crop yields have less nu- nutrition in them. That's one of the things that happens. They're also much more likely to be hit by drought. They're more likely to be hit by desertification. There's going to be less arable land in the first place. And because of this, this uh, increased instability in the system, it, and also from uh, uh, more unstable weather, all these, these things that add up, that means you have to dedicate more land to this food in order to make sure that you can guarantee a sustainable amount of food that's always coming in and, and you don't have these shocks that will end up killing millions or hundreds of millions of people. And you find yourself in this death spiral, this Cats 22, where you have to use more and more land continuously in order to protect yourselves from the shocks of the system. But these land use that's increasing and increasingly done in unsustainable ways in order to milk more and more out of the less and less remaining land that's appropriate for this because of these encroaching deserts, because of this lack of water, means that you are just intensifying the effects on the system and finding yourself more and more in a deeper hole. And climbing out of that hole is getting increasingly hard as time goes on, which this paper lacks any source of urgency in it. There are, uh, you know, as Daniel mentioned, these different pathways that take us forward into different routes of the future. And they're built on different things, and maybe Daniel will expand upon them and, and explain it in a moment. But there is no real sense of urgency besides a couple of graphs that turn red or purple in certain places. But this paper really tried to limit itself from conversations of actual numbers of impacts on people. Outside every now and then, you know, you'll see something like food will be 80% more expensive by 2050 or something like that. But the fact is, you know, this is a paper that outlines Armageddon. And if we don't act now, the mitigation strategies for this become more and more difficult. They become more and more expensive and they become more and more limited in the land available to them in the first place because we're going to have to dedicate more resources to simply surviving. And you know, like, like we've talked about in, in entirely other situations where if somebody's spending their life just trying to survive, they don't have a lot of time trying to make the world around them better. They don't have a lot of time to try and make the community better. They don't have time to do anything except focus on the fact that all of their energy, physical and mental and emotional, is devoted solely to the fact trying to keep their head above this metaphorical water. And we will soon find ourselves on a continental, uh, on a global civilizational level of doing the same exact thing, where if we're trying just to survive in this increasingly inhospitable world, how can we even think that we're going to have any sort of extra resources or capacity to dedicate to trying to make that world better and trying to make our problems less dramatic? If we don't act now, it's going to get harder and harder to act. It's that old adage, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday or 20 years ago or whatever, but the next best time is right now. And the longer we wait, the deeper we're going to find ourselves in this hole. And I think that urgency, that lack of of concrete, you know, we need to do this now, is huge emission in this paper. And I think lives, potentially enormous amounts of lives, will be lost because of that. And now I've really gotten ahead of myself, Daniel. Well, to be fair, David, in, in previous IPCC reports, they have come out and said, hey, you know, we have 12 years. 12 years to do something drastic or else runaway climate change will be unstoppable and we we have no we can do nothing about it. And that was optimistic. It was optimistic. Um and we talk about that. I think it was episode 50 Apocalypse Now. Is that right, David? I mean, it's definitely mentioned there, but I, I don't know if 
by the time that episode came out, um, more recent papers suggesting that that 12 years was actually closer to 18 months had, uh, had been out yet. Um, but I know we've mentioned that 18 month figure before. So, uh, the clock is ticking, but continue. And it sounds to me based on, uh, parts of your rant rant that I was actually listening to that, uh, we need to do something, uh, we need to do something now. And who is we, who are we? I think that's uh, something we can touch on in a little bit, but real quick. Okay. So all this land is changing. We're driving desertification. We're setting the Amazon rainforest on fire for some reason. Uh, we're doing all these things, right? And like you mentioned, that comes with risks. There are consequences to that. And uh, lucky for us, the IPCC goes into this a little bit. I'll just read a quick quote from them. Quote, Increasing risks associated with desertification include population exposed and vulnerable to water scarcity and drylands. Risks related to land degradation include increased habitat degradation, population exposed to wildfire and floods, and the cost of floods. Risks to food security include availability and access to food, including population at risk of hunger, food price increases, and increases in disability adjusted life years attributable due to childhood underweight, end quote. You know, David, as we discuss frequently, but perhaps not enough on this show, the people who will be most immediately impacted by climate change are the poor and the vulnerable. But that being said, you know, no region or group of people will be able to avoid some consequence of global warming. For example, while desertification poses the largest risk to people in Asia and Africa, Those in the tropics and subtropics are going to experience crop failure more frequently than others. Uh, Populations that live in higher and colder latitudes may not know how to adapt to the impact of melting permafrost and the invasion of pests and disease, while those in North America, South America, South Africa, and the Mediterranean are in danger of massive and unstoppable wildfire. But I know what you're saying. You're saying, aha, that's why I live on the coast. There can be no wildfires on the beach. Well, (laughs) that is what I was saying. Yeah. Well, unfortunately for uh, coastal neighborhoods, there are going to be massive hurricanes and sea level rise leading to coastal flooding. And as the IPCC points out, although the poor are the most vulnerable, being rich doesn't save you because the health impacts of all this fall disproportionately on children, the elderly, and women. And I think everyone knows somebody in that cohort. And of course, for the rich men out there, well, what what can money buy to avoid a hurricane or a massive wildfire, right? And all this change, as you would expect, will magnify the rate of migration as more and more people are displaced from their homes, which unfortunately is going to encourage, as it has encouraged, many countries to take a turn towards authoritarian nationalism. And we go in depth on this topic of migration and wall building in episode 31, No Entry. And if you haven't listened to that, I encourage you to put it on your list as well, because the politics of border control that we discussed then are only getting worse. And it's important that we understand this process and how the narrative that we're often told that there's this great danger of migration, that there's this crisis at the border, whatever border you happen to be thinking about or in relation to, those narratives don't always line up with the reality. And we need to understand that. Well, since we seem to be on a roll of recommending old episodes right now, Danny, we do actually have an episode where we talk about, at some extreme length, the uh, history of borders and maps and and passports and how we got in this sort of situation. That's episode 60, Drawn Apart. So if you like hearing me ramble about history for an extended period of time, uh, that is definitely one to check out. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. And these risks are coming about because the earth is changing. You know, as the IPCC puts it, climate zones will expand and push poleward, which you mentioned earlier, David. And what that means to me when I'm trying to conceptualize it is that we will see the blurring of distinct climates. So going back to Biosphere 2, their goal was to create an, a closed system like you mentioned, but also include as many of Earth's natural biomes as possible. So there was an ocean, there was a uh, rainforest, there was a savanna. Um, All these things were included in it. And as you walk around, it it kind of feels like you go distinctly from one to the other. And that's kind of how the earth is, right? We we do have very distinct climates. And we're used to thinking of things like higher latitudes as being very cold, containing these ancient and calm boreal forests. 
deep permafrost, you know, that type of thing. Well, the lower latitudes have more diverse ecosystems. They're warmer. There's more bugs and wildlife. You have diverse habitats from grasslands to swamps. And then you get towards the equator and it's all tropical. There's jungles, big elephant ear leaves on these crazy trees, multicolored parrots. Um, and then, of course, you have regions of desert and vast savanna landscapes, you know, whatever. But the current trends in warming are in many ways removing these distinctions and kind of compressing everything together into this homogenous, uh, weird, uh, where, where every, nothing makes sense kind of land, right? Where in the higher latitudes, the once secluded and preserved forests are being invaded by ticks for the very first time. Permafrost is melting and Arctic ice is disappearing. Elsewhere, grasslands are turning into desert and regions of extreme heat around the equator are expanding. And so it's like all these diverse climate zones are being pushed upwards towards the poles and being compressed and kind of combined. And in that process, crowding out a lot of unique habitats. Probably the most unscientific thing anyone's ever heard. That's because they haven't heard my flat earth rant. <laughs> and so that's kind of sad to think about. I don't like to think about that, David. But another sad thing to think about is how the, the changing climate undergoes feedback loops. This is something we talk about a lot in the context of climate change. And, and it's where one process sets off another process, which then reinforces the original process, right? And there are tons of these that go on with our Earth systems. The more the Earth warms, the harder it becomes to prevent it from warming because it starts to run away and, and do its own thing. One that I like to think about is that because land temperature is accelerating twice as fast as the global average, you have dryland areas experiencing faster rates of evapotranspiration, which causes a loss of water in the soil, which combines with decreased rainfall and leads to desertification, which then turns into a global feedback because more deserts mean fewer plants to absorb and store carbon, in addition to the direct release of carbon into the atmosphere as plant matter is lost. And we actually have a whole episode on desertification because I'm really enjoying uh, recommending old episodes. It's number 56, Beneath the Paving Stones, The Desert. And if you haven't listened to that, <laughs> put it on your list. And in that episode, we talk about the interesting contrast between grasses and shrubs, which lead to desertification and the ways plants themselves contribute to local climates. This is something that I found fascinating. In this case, not only does rainfall come less often because of global climate variabilities, but plants themselves contribute to local rain patterns by transpiring water into the atmosphere. So a decrease in plant matter means less water is retained in the soil, which means less water is transpired into the immediate atmosphere, which means less rainfall, and so on and so on. And this reminds me of a really interesting thing, David, I learned reading a little book called The Hidden Life of Trees. Have you heard of this? Yeah, it's on my list of things to read, actually. Yeah, it came out a couple of years ago, I think, but it seems to have made a resurgence lately. I've heard a lot of people talk about it. But the fascinating thing that this forester talks about in this book, this is a, a guy who uh, was a forester or is a forester in Germany for a long time. He was managing these forests for the benefit of lumber companies. The more he learned about the forest, he realized that it's not the case of just individual trees that happen to make up a forest, but the individual trees themselves are communicating, sharing resources and ensuring the success of what we originally would think of as their competitors. And there's a lot he goes into in this book about why they do that and how they do it. It's very fascinating. But one of the most obvious things that, that you start to realize is that an individual tree, as it would exist in the forest, cannot really survive on its own very easily. There are environmental factors that make it difficult for a tree to survive, like harsh winds which uh, erode the soil around it or, or pose a physical challenge. And then there's the sun, which bears down on the, the ground and dries it out and uh, raises that surface temperature, which then decreases the humidity around the tree. But when trees work together to keep each other alive, they can create canopy cover, which acts to deflect the sun from drying out the soil. And huddled together like that, they prevent the wind from coming through their leaves and also disturbing them. And in addition to that, forests kind of create their own climates. You have increased rainfall occurring in really diverse forests as the humidity from the water that they transpire. But in addition, if you've ever walked through a jungle, David, or have been in a greenhouse, it's very humid. 
And this is also something that benefits the individual tree when it works together with others in its vicinity, is that by huddling together, they trap humidity in the air around them. From the IPCC report, quote, changes in land conditions can affect temperature and rainfall in regions as far as hundreds of kilometers away, end quote. Well, these, these are the types of feedback loops that can quickly get out of control, Daniel. And transpiration, you mentioned right there, the process of plants releasing water um, into the atmosphere is, is, is a fundamental building block of rainforest, right? So the Amazon, for example, the leaves open up, they release this water vapor, it turns to this mist that coalesces into clouds because there's just so much vegetation, so much life in this area that it's so dense that when this transpiration process begins, it actually fundamentally alters the humidity of the air to the point where uh, the air itself can no longer hold all this, this liquid. And eventually it comes back down as rain and gives us that moniker that we're so familiar with the rainforest. It's a fundamental element of what creates the rainforest and it acts as its own localized feedback loop. The rain that comes back down, you know, gives the plants enough rain that they are able to open up to transpire to uh, release this liquid and, and, and continue this process. But, you know, it, you have to get to the point where that there's enough water vapor release that it's able to get to that, that point where it turns into clouds and rain. Because if you just have this traditionally, you are transpiring, you are releasing uh, this liquid, you are adjusting local temperatures, uh, typically cooling it, um, which is something that we saw uh, recently, at, again, at Biolab in a very interesting way where they were planting um, plants and crops underneath raised solar panels and for this transpiration process to act as a cooling uh, mist, essentially, to the back of the panels to make them more efficient at the magnitude of 4 to 7%. But if you don't have enough of this happening, if you don't have enough density, enough vegetation releasing enough water vapor that it, that it starts this loop, then you end up with the system crashing. And that's something that we might find ourselves on very soon in the Amazon, where because of damage to the sheer size of the Amazon through burning practices, through deforestation, um, and through forest fires that are running out of control, literally as we speak, as well as the decreased amount of ecological variability and the general plant life that we find in this through increased stresses on the environment from rising temperatures and droughts that are responsible for this, which is also something that they're studying at Biolab, taking the rainforest biome right now, not giving it the rain it needs and seeing how it responds. And the, the spoiler alert is not so well. These are the triggers that can click over and make sure that transpiration process is suddenly not enough. And once that happens very rapidly, you'll see the Amazon or whatever, whatever other rainforest this happens to die in huge amounts. The uh, life in these rainforests are highly dependent upon this process and the vast amounts of liquid that it puts into the system. And when that stops happening, which can happen very suddenly, this vast land will turn into grasslands. Prairie. This is sort of what happened through much of Central Africa, where we see those those typical grasslands that are stereotypical. Um, a lot of that used to be rainforest. And once that happens, not only have we lost a huge amount of ecological diversity, but we've lost some of the most important carbon sinks on this planet. And the decaying material plant life that happens in this transition is going to release huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, thus exacerbating this process. Once again, finding ourselves in one of these feedback loops. And in that process, we're also losing one of the lungs of the earth for poisoning the water in the ocean, the acidification, deoxygenation, damaging the ability of much of the algae on earth that we depend upon for the vast majority of our oxygen to produce that oxygen that we need so badly. And we're doing the same thing to this other vast oxygen producer, the Amazon rainforest and the rainforest around the country, around the world. Then we are creating a world that is increasingly less hospitable to all life. And, you know, you'll see some people talk about the greening process. It's actually mentioned in this report where the increased CO2 levels in the atmosphere have been good for plants. And Earth has noticeably gotten greener over the past few decades because of this, via satellite imagery, though it depends on region to region. And that's one of the positive effects they mentioned in here because they do look at the positive and the negative effects of uh, human anthropogenic climate change on the Earth and the related greenhouse gas emissions. It's not all bad, but most of it is. But unfortunately, that greening process seems to have a cutoff point where once you surpass a certain level of carbon dioxide, you're no longer benefiting the plants. They don't turn green anymore. And it seems for much of the Earth's surface, recent reports have shown that the greening has stopped. So we're getting at a saturation point. And again, not to keep going back to Biolab, but studies there run by Columbia University 
um, in the early 2000s, the same studies that discovered the term ocean acidification actually, found that once you surpass about 700 parts per million, something that we're well on our way to hitting within this century, that these vast carbon sinks like the rainforest stop absorbing carbon at all. And you can learn more about this uh, process of saturating the atmosphere with CO2 in episode seven, Last Gasp, one of our favorites. But you know, the process you're talking about, David, will never occur because uh, Fire Day will wipe out the rainforest through fire. <laughs> Bolsonaro is not going to allow water to uh, win in the destruction of the rainforest. David, fire is going to win. Well, it's a competition, so uh, that's exciting at least. You can bet on which one destroys us all first. Just to quickly get out of the way, another quick feedback loop, because these things are important, and it is worth noting this in the larger terms of this report. Agriculture. You know, we talk about that a lot on this show. We talk about it a lot in this report. Agriculture has been used to create these vast homogenous landscapes, and this is primarily because of the way that we go about our agriculture. That dreaded word of monoculture. The practice of growing single crops in vast amounts over huge amounts of land at the degradation of the land itself, as well as the animals and, and insect life that live upon it. And of course, you know, it, it's, it's not just something that exists in a vacuum, but also our chemical process of growing, uh, that is this nitrogen fertilizer primarily, is a large driver of this. So we use this nitrogen often uh, overused maybe in this industrial agriculture. And when it concentrates in the soil, when we are putting it on these vast monoculture crops, it actually prevents the growth of many native species of plants. It makes the soil something called too hot. The, there's too much nitrogen into the soil. These plants don't want to grow. And this, of course, undermines biodiversity. And then it doesn't stop there. This nitrogen runs off. It poisons rivers and lakes, causes massive algae blooms that prevents plants from growing, rejuvenating the water. And it also suffocates, if not directly poisoning, all sorts of fish and other aquatic species. And all of this is acting as one of the major drivers of climate change. And so we're seeing this increased drought and intense precipitation events cause further soil loss and lag degradation that further reduces biodiversity and limits the land's ability to sequester carbon effectively. So you can see it's, it's never just one thing. It's this plus this plus this plus this plus this plus this all add up to make things even worse. And then they play off each other and make the problems more significant. Um, as we degrade the land, we have to rely more on this chemical crutch in order to get us back to uh, sustainable and profitable, and that's the key word, profitable levels of plant production. And so we just end up making the situation worse and worse and worse. And that is the thing that keeps coming back to in this paper, but also in this larger conversation about climate change that we've had over the course of almost 90 episodes throughout this show. Um, in the papers that are written by thousands and tens of thousands of researchers around the world is if we excel at one single thing, it's trying to destroy the earth in as many different ways as possible, all at the same time. Um, man, I'm in a mood today, Daniel. Yes, you are. Well, destroying the earth is really only relevant to humans, David, in the way it affects humans. I mean, that's ultimately what we care about, right? And I mean, that is a very efficient way to talk about it, I suppose. And what is agriculture but a way of producing food? And some 50% of the entire world depends on food that comes from interconnected global supply chains and the outputs of industrial agriculture. And this system is at great risk. As things change, not only do higher CO2 levels in the atmosphere impact nutritional content of plants, but the increased severity and frequency of weather events means more logistical disruptions of delivering that food. It also means bad harvests. And in one scenario explored by the IPCC, Cereal crop prices increased globally by a median 7.6% by 2050, while some regions experience as much as a 23% increase in crop prices. Well, actually, Daniel, on some of these reports, it mentions that if we uh, add some sort of mitigation strategies like reforestation, which is something we need to keep you know, Earth from being destroyed, that it could increase food prices by as much as 80%, not just you know, seven to 23%, but 80%, almost double the cost in food of what it would be otherwise, which, you know, increases less than that have kicked off revolutions all around the world. So, um, and they sneak that in there just as like a tiny footnote underneath a graph, and then they just blow past it as, you know, these types of reports like to do. David, well, actually, Torsivia. 
you take that back. <laughs> well, actually, David, um, you might have seen that in uh, footnote 2.B on page 132, but I looked at foot point, uh 7Z on uh, page 364, and it actually says something different. Actually, it's uh, panel B, uh, reforestation and forest restoration on page 29. The exact figure there is linked in 6.4.5.1.2. So. Well, well, you know, whatever the numbers are, um, the IPCC says that, hey, these changes are bad. We need to adapt to them. And of course, they present these projections of how human civilization might progress and, and the ability for these different scenarios of humans to adapt to all these changes. But personally, David, you know, this is something we alluded to. I feel like the IPCC presents a few contradictions or false assumptions in their projections oh. of adaptation. What? The IPCC would never do that. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but for example, okay, their best case scenario for food security involves a world that is only high income, so no or very little income inequality, and a system of free trade. While their worst case scenarios tend to include things like poverty, high income inequality, and barriers to trade. Now, why do I feel like this is a contradiction? Well, besides imagining a world where everyone is just rich, I don't even know how that's possible or what that means. Uh, Putting that aside, historically speaking, free trade has almost always been a force that decouples communities from their own land and creates dependency on sprawling supply chains, which themselves are a major factor in global warming. We discussed that briefly with Dr. Patrick Bigger in episode 84, Carbon Bootprint. And I think you alluded to this earlier, David, how the carbon life cycle of many products that we consume is undervalued because, well, for one, there is a military presence needed to secure the supply chains that deliver goods across international waters. And we don't take into account the greenhouse gas effect of militarizing the world. And if you haven't listened to episode 37, The Logistics of Slavery, put that on your growing list of things to go back to because we go in depth on how logistics and supply chains have been reshaping the globe, undermining the agency of local people, enslaving marginalized people, and fueling this militarization of the world. And I think I probably get where the IPCC is coming from. Maybe their logic is like, well, you know, this region only grows one type of crop. So if climate change disrupts their ability to grow that one crop, they're in big trouble unless they can import other stuff. But again, this is a contradiction because so many regions, like you talked about, are forced to specialize in mono production precisely because they're enslaved to a global supply chain. Famous example from episode 11, Designing Deception, the Guatemalan peasants who wanted to own their own land and grow their own crops were murdered in the 1950s so that the country could be converted a exclusively to banana plantation. So do they need to import other food? Yes, because we won't let them grow their own. I mean, yeah, I guess being able to trade with other regions is important generally, but but a more important focus is who controls that trade. And we should probably be encouraging communities around the world to adopt self-sufficiency first and foremost. But the IPCC goes in depth on on some of their recommendations on how we as a global civilization can adapt and mitigate these changes in global climate. And as you would expect, a lot of their recommendations are basically to do the opposite of what we have been doing. Whoa, who would have guessed? (laughs) Who would have guessed? Quote, a select set of options deliver across all challenges. These options include, but are not limited to, sustainable food production. (laughs) That's, That's that quote I was mentioning earlier. Yeah, and it doesn't stop there. Improved and sustainable forest management soil organic carbon management, ecosystem conservation, and land restoration, reduced deforestation and degradation, and reduced food loss and waste, end quote. It's, I mean, it's, so what ultimately this report is, is hundreds of pages of scientists trying to prove to politicians that we should be sustainable with our land use and not waste food. That's, that's what this is. That's what we've come to. That the uh, idea that, that being sustainable and the idea that not you know, creating huge amounts of waste is radical and deserving of you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours of, of research and proving and, and who knows whatever work and, and add to the summary and being distributed around the world with, with 
who knows what kind of carbon uh, cost is associated with that. I mean, that's the point we're at, where we have to justify this stuff that should anybody would tell you, oh, yeah, of course, you know, don't take more than what you can put back in and uh, don't waste what you do take out. That is like a story as old as time. Right. Um, Not to go like nativist, but I mean, the stereotype of the Native American using, you know, every part of the animal. And uh, having cultural mythologies of what happens to people who didn't utilize the entire animal, who wasted, is a story for a reason. This is, once again, that indigenous logic that seems so obvious to everyone, literally everyone, for thousands of years and allow them to live, you know, mostly sustainably. I'm not saying that every, um, every group lives sustainably. There's a lot that aren't here anymore because they didn't. But... We have to rediscover this knowledge, quantify it. And this is what that, this paper really is. It's the quantification of basic, obvious knowledge before we can, we can package it and justify it and turn it into a report and say, well, if we you know, do this obvious basic thing, uh, it's going to cost us this much stuff. But ultimately, we can get a gain of whatever or um, you know, uh, improve disability affected life years by this much, blah, 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 which is stupid. It's fucking stupid. That we have to take, once again, very basic, not the kind of thing you would teach a kindergartner, right? The kindergartner comes into a room, you know, and they mess stuff up. And you're like, okay, well, you know, if you're going to mess up and play with things, that's fine. We need to put it back uh, and, and leave it nice. You teach kids who go camping for the first time, you know, don't mess up the stuff around you. Leave it nicer than when you found it. These are very basic things you teach very small children. Share, you know, um, cooperate with each other. And then they spend the rest of their life with culture and business and schooling teaching you to do exactly the opposite in order to get ahead as quickly as possible. And now we have to reteach the people who are in charge of everything to have these very basic fundamental uh, like ideas of what it is to be humans on this planet. Because we've gotten so disconnected from our land, from our land use, because we live in these temples of concrete and asphalt and and steel and glass that we don't know what it looks like when we destroy the land around us because we've never seen it or have any stories related to it. All our stories are linked to people. They're linked to places, but artificial places. And there is no link to the natural world anymore. There's no link to the land that we see around us. And then therefore in that process, unconsciously and subconsciously make into our own and associate ourselves with and making it very easy to want to pursue this idea of defending that land. We had a story, um, a phone call recently, and we'll play it at some point. I'm thinking this episode, but sometime soon from somebody who grew up in a rural area and a rural area, actually that Daniel and I recently found ourselves driving through kind of sort of then moving to the suburbs and finding just how disconnected they were with everything. They, they call us to talk about that suburb episode that we just did. And the way it made them feel and, and how they felt trapped. That's the word they use, trapped. Uh, makes me feel crazy. And that's all of us. Not all of us were lucky enough to have that initial part where we were able to build that bond with the land. But when we watch content and we watch media and we see the land around us and we see what's being destroyed and lost, we feel it on some level, that deep soul-crushing loss of something that we never even knew we wanted or a part of or could have had. Something that was always denied from us by the way we've decided to live our lives and construct our larger society. And so this, this man that called us took his family and moved back into the country. And his wife says that he, he ruined her in the process because she could never go back. And he called to tell us about how he was watching this country around him suffer and die. How the trees are turning brown, how the land is being ripped out to create this improved uh, pasture land for ranchers, and how no one understands why that's wrong. No one understands these larger pictures of, of what's happening. And he's on a crusade to try and, and spread that idea. But the things that he feels the connections he has with, with, with the land itself in Apache County, which I think is appropriate, and I'll tell you why in just a moment, is something that we need to try and find. Because that's the only way we're going to be able to easily defend the land is if we feel connected to it once more. And the reason I mentioned Apache County in particular is because the Apache, more so than maybe any other native group, have a deep relation to the land. And that relation is because they name the land and they walk among it. A typical Apache community 
has a you know range of of miles in any direction, but within that that area, they have hundreds of place names, and the place names are very specific. Things like uh, man has to climb up here, or or descriptions that that give you a very visual, immediate identity of what that place is, and then they weave their stories of their tribe of their uh, larger community through these places with the elders of the tribe explaining in stories to the young and, and to the, uh, the middle-aged, the tribe mythology within these places, they start every story with the name of a place that it happened. And then they end it with the name of that place where it ends. And some of these stories are used to discuss uh, problems people had. So say, say you came in and, and you, you sinned against someone else. Eventually, during the tribe meeting a few weeks later, an elder would tell a story, a parable designed to attack you on that specific sin that you did. And no one would know it was necessarily about you, but you would know. And what's important about that story, the fact that it starts and ends in the same place, a place that you live in, a place that you walk by, or ride by, or drive by all the time, means that you are now part of this place. You see that rock formation, that canyon, whatever it is. And you are associated with that story and with that sin that you did. Every time you see it, it's a reminder to live a better life. Every time you see it, it's a reminder of the person that told you that story. Even when they pass away, decades later, that story sticks with you. That person sticks with you. That moment sticks with you. And that reminder to live a better life sticks with you. It's embedded within the land itself. It's a memory and a community weaved into the land. And we don't have that anymore. We don't have any relationship with the land. It's a thing that we exploit. It's a thing that we turn into goods and products to ship around the world and profit off of, a thing to exploit. And that's because we've become so disconnected from the land because we never see it. We never have that opportunity to build that bond. And without that bond, this idea of land use, this idea of what does 40% of the earth use for pasture look like, we have no idea, is something that is impossible for us to overcome. Because we're so disconnected. So, uh, I mean, I don't know what the solution for this, this element is here, Daniel, on the grander scale. But I want to encourage everybody to find a place very close to where you live. It's some sort of landmark. It could be a tree. It could be a patch of dirt. It could be a park. It could be a hill. It could be a rock. It could be a boulder. It could be anything. You know, something that stands out to you. And I want you to, to imagine that thing in your your head right now. It's probably something you've seen hundreds or dozens of times before. And I want you to associate these thoughts with that place. The thoughts of the ideas we've laid out in this episode, but also this entire show, the thoughts of these systemic issues and the ways of living unsustainably that have doomed us unless we take drastic action right now. And I want you to think about what it would be to build a better world, what it would take to live sustainably, what it means to try and live better. And I want you to associate those ideas with that thing, that rock, that tree, that park, whatever it is. And I want every time you go past that to think about those things and tell someone else. Because that awareness and that bond to the communities that we live in is absolutely necessary if we want to start making any headway on these problems. That's a great idea, David. You said a lot there, and I just want to come back to something. When you have something like the IPCC report and the media is reporting on it, it's always framed a certain way. And that way is the IPCC came out with a new report in August of 2019 saying that if we don't change our land use policies, we could have dramatic consequences. They recommend that we do this and that. And uh, I started to think about this and you know, you were talking about how frustrating it is to read this report and be like, this, this is common sense stuff, right? Things that you would teach a child, put back what you take, don't destroy things, right? But look at the, the title of this report or, or just the phrase summary for policymakers. I mean, this is a report aimed at policymakers, our politicians, our global leaders. And when we talk about we need to change our land use policies. We need to change this. Who, who is it talking about? Who, who is the we in that sentence? Is it, me, is it you and me, David? Is it our listeners? I don't think that's true because we, you and me, David, our listeners, we are not the ones who destroyed this planet. We are not the ones who 
set back and allowed corporations to pillage the earth. And we are not the ones in the Amazon right now. Maybe, but you probably benefit from that beef they're going to grow down there. You probably benefit from the, the uh, corporations that destroyed everything uh, if, to fuel your consumerism. I mean, you can't absolve yourself, Daniel, of, of stuff. And I'm not saying that, that we aren't maybe less responsible than some others, but uh, we all carry a, a guilt with us, some, some of us much more than others. Um, and and you, you can't mitigate that. But that's not the point. The, the point is not who benefits. The point is who's going to create the change. And it's not us asking our policymakers to create incentives to encourage some different thing. The only thing that's going to change this is for us, you and me, and the, our listeners to stand up against the corporations and institutions that are actively doing these things. And that includes the politicians who have set by and deregulated the earth so that corporations could come in and pillage everything. And yeah, I mean, everyone who eats a, a $1 burger at McDonald's benefits from that. But the fact that the global powers that be have enabled a infrastructure in our world where a corporation can destroy a forest to provide livestock land and then subsidize that so that anyone can afford a $1 burger is a larger issue than how we as individuals end up being consumers along that process. Yes. And the, well, the weird thing here, Daniel, is that I'm scrolling through this report, all 41 pages, and I don't, I don't see the uh, IPCC recommending people uh, stand up to corporations and uh, politicians and trying to get things changed on a systemic level. But I do see them saying that individuals should change their uh, dietary patterns. So, well, well, that's but that's my point. This is a joke. It's directed at policymakers when policymakers are the ones who have enabled these processes to go forward in the first place. Oh yeah. And so I'm rejecting the message that, that's coming from this media that is, uh, oh, we need to change our land use policies. It is not our land use policies. I did not make these land use policies. You did not make these land use policies. It is our political leaders who have profited off of opening the door to the profit motive to take hold and to be the priority in how we organize our land. And unless we as people say it's not good enough to simply incentivize companies, it's not good. Here's another example. This might uh, paint a better picture. So I was also listening to a different media network talk about this IPCC report. And one of the journalists or, or reporters said, oh, well, you know, we have a lot of products that contain palm oil and, you know, palm oil plantations are destroying forests and leading to all these terrible things. So, you know, we need to encourage palm oil companies to alter their business strategy. And I'm saying, no, those companies need to go out of business. They don't need a different business strategy. They need to not exist. And if our politicians are going to simply just work on solutions that are going to try to incentivize them to act differently, we need to reject that and say, no, you need to put them in the grave. You need to take these oil CEOs and the people who are leading armies of capital and infrastructure and machines destroying our world and say, you are the enemy. We cannot allow you to exist. It's not that you need a different business strategy. It's you need to get off the planet. And that should be our attitude going forward. Hell yeah, I'll send them to Mars. <laughs> All we need to do is build just a couple rockets. Yeah, we'll use a little bit of jet fuel, and that's bad. But think about the long-term benefit. We send a couple CEOs into Mars, they never come back. Yeah, but let's, uh, let's like crowdsource the rocket design and do like a shoddy job of it. If you know what I mean. I'll leave that to the listeners of us who uh, have a more vivid imagination. But, you know, it's, all, it's not all bad advice here in the IPCC. You know, they do recommend ways for us to move forward. And they actually make a good point, which is that many of the mitigation and, and options we have going forward can be categorized into things that are long-term and short-term. Uh, you know, longer-term options are typical things we might think of, such as reforesting regions or preventing deforestation. But there are also so many choices we can make that have immediate short-term benefits, such as preserving the already existing high carbon ecosystems that we have, like wetlands, mangrove forests, and peatlands. And peatlands are important because as we discussed in episode 21, Climate Ex Machina, forests reach a point where they no longer sequester additional carbon from the atmosphere because the absorption rates balances out with the respiration and decay. Uh, peatlands, on the other hand, 
is uh, an ecosystem that can sequester carbon for centuries into the future. And what is a peatland? These occur all over the world. It's a form of wetland. It's where a high water table exists where plants grow, but within this water, oxygen deficiency prevents the decay of plant matter once it dies and sinks to the bottom of the water. And after a time, this decayed matter turns into peat, and it is a form of sequestered carbon. Meanwhile, plants continue to grow at the surface, converting CO2 to oxygen. So these wetlands have a much higher ability to sequester carbon, uh, in some cases than, let's say, like a mature forest. Because when the trees of the forest die, they are quickly decomposed, releasing all their stored carbon back into the atmosphere. And so while peatlands account for just 3% of all land, they store between 21 and 42% of all global soil carbon. And right now we are actively draining some 10% of these uh, ecosystems, converting thousands of years of stored carbon into giant outputters of carbon. And you know, we talk a lot about reforestation and, and regenerative agriculture, but here's an example of like, hey, if we just stopped draining these things, we might do more for our ability to sequester carbon and, and do more in, in terms of halting our current greenhouse gas emissions than we might be able to do in the short term uh, for some other longer term process, like improving the ability of mineral soil to sequester carbon, which is a much longer term process. But if you're also interested in how you, if you have a farm or want to get into farming, can do a little bit yourself to improve the land beneath your feet. And if you haven't already, check out episode 16, What We Reap with permaculture farmer Chris D'Alessandro and episode 26, Barriers to Growth, where we talk to Land Trust Director Ian McSweeney. A lot of these solutions mean that we have to support initiatives that undermine the influence of international corporations. And that means we have to promote our ability to get our own communities self-sufficient by learning how to take care of the land we already have. David, do you have any other ideas about what we can do? Well, if you were to ask the uh, IPCC, they uh, talk about BEX once again. Um, So, you know, let's just take that. You remember in the beginning of the show, I said there's 20 million uh, square kilometers of unused, untouched, pristine land. Well, uh, IPCC wants to turn 15 million of that into uh, bioenergy fuels. So uh, let's just do that. That sounds easy. Problem solved. Then I can keep on eating burgers for forever and, uh, you know, burning gas for fun and uh, we can build a better world. Something in your voice tells me you uh, don't quite believe that. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, I think I gave away my positions throughout this episode and over the previous hundred hours or whatever it is that, that we've established at this point. But, you know, like I, I, I mentioned in my weird uh, Apache segue, uh, which if you haven't uh, read it, there's a great book called The uh, Spell of the Sensuous. I sort of jacked that story from there. Give it a read. It's fantastic. Um, find your connection to the land, whether it's something local, a tree, a patch of wildflowers, a park, you know, something that isn't necessarily wild or natural, but it's something that makes you feel connected to the land. That's a start. If you can get out of your city or your suburb, if you're not lucky enough to live somewhere where you are surrounded by this beauty, do that. Slip outside of these uh, images of our civilization and find yourself once again in the cradle that birthed it all. And look around and find your connection to the earth, to the land that sustains us. When you feel reconnected to this common wealth that we all share and own, that some people have been given permission to exploit and destroy in the interest of preserving the uh, tragedy, the commons of of land rights of whatever, you know, if you can regain your feeling of stewardship beyond the, the limitations of what we've decided is private property with the ability to destroy or exploit in any way that you see fit, then you're on the right step. If you can share that feeling of feeling connected to the earth, of the larger significance it gives you as an individual, as a human, in a world made up of billions of other humans, hundreds of billions or trillions of other life forms that all live here interconnected, dependent upon each other, dependent upon this fragile balance that we have so arrogantly interrupted in order to live this life of temporary wealth and excess. 
If you can feel reconnected to that global web, then you're on the right path. And if you can take that feeling and you can share it with others and you can give them the tools to express that feeling that you get when you look over a beautiful scenic view, when you find yourself walking through hallways of massive trees, when you find that connection back to the earth that born you, then you are on the right path. And if you can give people the tools to step forward and start spreading this knowledge to others, that feeling of connectedness, both with the earth and with each other, then you're on the right path. And if we can keep pushing down this path and starting to take action on this stuff, either by connecting with others, giving them the tools, or finding people who are already doing this and following in their footsteps, then we are on the right path. And we need to get on this path right now, immediately. And we need to be pushing down here and we need to be making sure that we are holding those accountable that doomed us. Those people you mentioned that are left out of this report, Daniel, who live between the lines of these words talking about just how fucked we are in the driest, most scientific language possible, high confidence. Then we can start pushing them where they need to go in order to find ourselves in a world that is sustainable, in a world that doesn't doom our future children then we are on the right path. There's a lot of talk about mitigating climate change, which is important, obviously. We should be fighting back against the forces that are adding fuel to the rapid degradation of our land uh, you know, and the acceleration of global warming. But remember the flip side of the coin is adaptation. I know many of our listeners have expressed deep pessimism around our collective ability to prevent climate change which uh, is probably a rational perspective. It's virtually impossible to prevent at this point. But that does not mean it's game over. Climate change will get worse, yes, but how bad the consequences are depend in large part on our preparation. Have you organized your community into groups for sharing resources, skills, needs? And has your community developed a plan of action in the event of water scarcity, food insecurity, and natural disaster? Well, if not, you have work to do. And when those things do occur, you'll be glad that you did. Does all your food come from a national grocery chain? Then you have work to do. Have you taken a first aid course? You have work to do. If you own a farm, how diverse are your crops? Do you have systems in place to capture and store rainfall? Do you have a plan to get out of debt so you can support your local community with local produce? If not, you have work to do. We might not ever snuff out the cancer that is international corporations and corrupt politicians intent on burning the rainforest to the ground, but we can make our families, our communities, and our regions strong and as self-sufficient as possible, which will simultaneously undermine that dependence that is the power base of those corporations while giving us the best shot possible of facing a changing world. So grab hold of your bootstraps, and let's all get to work. As always, Daniel, that's a lot to think about, and that's a lot to do. But we hope you'll get started. You can find more information about everything we talked about on this episode today, as well as read that actual IPCC report on our website at ashesashes.org. There's also a full transcript of this episode, as well as every episode on there, so check them out. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, the show possible. So if you like it and would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, giving us a review, one of those five-star ratings on uh, your favorite podcast app, or visiting us at patreon.com slash ashesashescast where you can send us some financial love, which we appreciate very much, and uh, we'll probably send you a sticker. We'd like to thank our associate producers, Chad Peterson and John Fitzgerald. Thank you so much. And another way you can support us, again, uh, get the word out. Help us on the marketing front by posting us to social media, your favorite internet forums. Use us in all those internet arguments you get into. Refer back to these conversations so that we can get more people involved and engaged in uh, any solution we can to a better world. And if you have ideas, thoughts, criticisms, recommendations, 
email us at contact at ashesashes.org. We have plenty of other ways of contacting us besides just email. Uh, One of our favorites is give us a phone call or send us an audio recording if you are international. We love hearing from listeners. We're putting them together into some awesome shows, and we'd love for your voice to be a part of that. So if you want to give us a call, you can do so at 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. We are also on all your favorite social media networks, posting awesome news stories, uh, updates on what's going on around the world, as well as some really kick-ass memes. And you can find us on your favorite social media network at Ashes Ashes Cast. Next week, we're back to our alternating chat shows. We've got a lot of fun things to talk about and some interviews on that, so uh, definitely tune in for then. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.